Okay. Uh, uh, okay, friends. So let's uh, uh, revise ourselves. What we are trying to do uh, is to derive the Dirac equation and study uh, its solutions uh, in the momentum space. So what did we do last time? So last time, uh, oh, what happened? Oh, okay, here it is. So what time? The last time we were looking at momentum space equation solutions for the Dirac equation, and the way we derived it uh, is just write uh, uh, the Dirac equation in terms of the momentum uh, in momentum space, where we identified del mu in terms of i p slash mu or k k mu essentially. Del mu slash would be just uh, p slash. And then uh, using this representation, which is called the Dirac representation. This representation is called the Dirac representation of the gamma matrices, where uh, gamma zero is nothing but the beta matrix, which we introduced some time ago, is one minus one. Uh, two by two matrices and gamma i is sigma minus i sigma. Okay, so this is anti-diagonal. And using this, uh, we derive the. Uh, so we put it back into the equations of motion uh, into the momentum space equation of motion, where uh, the u k is subdivided into u of uh, u and b, two spinors, two two component spinors. Now there is a reason why we do that. There is first of all there is a minus sign difference between the two component spinors. So uh, the upper has uh, a, the, uh, the lower spinor has a minus sign which is different compared to the upper uh, uh, upper spinor. That's the reason even within the within the equation of motion, and that's the reason why we separated it in terms of two two component spinors. The upper two components, in fact, uh, uh, have uh, the satisfy the a slightly different equation of motion, whereas the lower two components satisfy uh, another equation of motion because the first, the upper two components corresponding to uh, the positive energy solutions, and the lower two component corresponds to the negative energy solutions. So we wrote them down in part this particular fashion. And you see that the, both the equations of motion, uh, the upper part and the lower part, you can make them into quadratic and they satisfy the Klein Gordon equation essentially. U of, so the, both of them satisfy E square is equal to E square plus each component of the Dirac equation or the Dirac spinor satisfies the Klein Gordon equation. So this is the details. Uh, so where we have explicitly derived the momentum space solutions. And the four solutions have this particular format essentially. So you have these four solutions which are given in terms of this. Here I not done the normalization. I left the normalization as sort of uh, homework. OK, and uh, unfortunately today's assignment, I didn't mention the normalization, but anyway, uh, this is fine essentially, so you can derive it maybe in the next assignment and so on. Now, let's uh, see why. Uh, now, let's start uh, uh, looking at. Sorry, uh, not this one. Mm. So let's start looking at uh, the properties of this momentum space uh, 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 
uh, solutions. So one of the first properties we everybody is interested is what is uh, the, the Dirac equation? Uh, what is the normalization? Normalization. Now, once we have wave functions of some particular equations, we need to know that these wave, wave functions are complete, A, whether they satisfy completeness relation and they satisfy orthonormal relations. These are requirements for us from quantum mechanics point of view. Okay. So these two relations require uh, our some uh, meaning whether this they really can form they can represent uh, these two are extremely important for the for us to know whether these two uh, the set of equations uh, the set of solutions we have found uh, can represent physical states or not. So if they have to say represent physical states, they have to satisfy these two conditions. So for the first one, let's just look at what is. Uh, so what you would expect is for the uh, for the Klein Gordon we have we have phi dagger phi is equal to one. There is no problem actually. Okay, it's normal. Uh, you can easily normalize it. The solutions. So if I take the solution in terms of e power i k x, the plane wave solutions normalized. Now we said, okay, the Dirac the spinor is the square. The Dirac equation is the square of the klein gordon equation. So with that assumption, with that uh, sort of uh, thinking, say suppose if psi is equal to psi one, psi two, psi three, psi four, I would expect something like psi one dagger psi. Okay, psi one dagger psi should be. invariant. What do you mean with whether it's a scalar or not? OK, the problem is. Psi 1. OK, Psi 1 dagger Psi 1, uh, Psi dagger Psi, sorry. Is equal to mod, uh, so it's is equal to psi 1 star psi 1 plus psi 2 star psi 2 plus psi 3 star psi 3 plus psi 4 star psi 4. So this is nothing but mod psi 1 square plus mod psi 2 square plus mod On the face of it, it looks like a scalar, but this is not a Lorentz scalar. This is not a Lorentz scalar at all. Okay, what do I mean by that? It looks like it's a real number and so on, so it looks fine, but under Lorentz transformations, this quantity is not invariant. OK. Under Lorentz transformations. This quantity. Is. Uh, not invariant. Why? Now, this is an uh, actually the answer is non trivial. The answer is that the Dirac 
equation itself, the Dirac spinor is not a Lorentz invariant quantity. Okay, that is fine. Secondly, the Dirac equation itself is not Lorentz invariant. The reason why this happens because the Dirac equation inherently contains the spin information of a particle. The spin information of a particle. So what it means that if you see, okay, if you have one basis here, one frame is S1 and another, okay, let me call it uh, some other name, say not S1, uh, say because S will use it for the transformation. Uh, O1, the another frame, O2, and if you have a spin of the particle pointed in some other direction, depending upon the speed, okay, e, the spin may be completely different. It could be in principle in a completely different direction, depending upon the speed of the uh, speed, relative speed between the frames uh, say O1 and O2, depending upon the spin. So something which is, say, for example, moving up could be something else, uh, maybe looking at some opposite. So if you take a projection, of rather, uh, actually, rather, this spin itself is not a really uh, good quantity. So suppose if you have moving with, a, uh, say, particle is moving uh, with a spin uh, in up direction and it's moving in this direction, say for example, and I take the projection of the spin on the moving direction of the momentum direction. So it will be something like sigma dot P. Now, if you compute the sigma dot P, because this will be a C prime, P prime, because the momentum is completely different, okay? In a different frame, the momentum is completely different. So the sigma dot pre prime could be a completely different uh, thing, say something which is happening, uh, okay? So in principle, the Dirac equation, which is we wrote down, contains sigma dot p inside it, actually in the, uh, in the equation itself, E is not an invariant equation. So it is not constructed out of invariant quantities. So for example, compared to say klein gordon equation, which is constructed in terms of uh, invariant quantities like mod uh, del square and uh, m square. So the Dirac equation is not constructed in terms of the invariant quantities, but it is sort of, uh, it is called something called form invariant. So in O1, you still have the same form. And O2, you'll have the same form. But these two Dirac equations have the same form, but they are not equivalent, not equivalent. Okay, they are not really equivalent, actually. This wave function and this wave function are not exactly equivalent. But the form of this thing is exactly the same. 
So they are form invariant, but they are something called covariance. So the Dirac equation is covariant under Lorentz transformations. You know, the, uh, okay, it's a, essentially it transforms. So you can write it in the same form, but it's not exactly the same. So it is not exactly the same. Okay, the form seems looks looks like uh, uh, is exactly the same, but the equation and its solutions are not the same because purely because we have sigma dot p. Okay. Uh, as we have seen in lecture seven, in uh, uh, okay, so in lecture seven, so for example, I'll repeat that uh, part. So let's see that. Uh, so then, in momentum space, what we have is. The form of the Dirac equation is here we have uh, essentially P0 minus M or okay, minus P dot sigma. Then we have P dot sigma. Then this is minus P0 minus plus M times UA UB. So this is your Dirac equation in momentum space. So what we did see now, you see that there are two things. P dot sigma comes here. So the upper transforms in a different way, the lower transforms in a different way. So there is a P dot sigma and one of them, another one is minus P dot sigma. So if one of them is P dot sigma, the other one is minus P dot sigma. So under the Lorentz transformation, the upper one would transform in a different way automatically and the lower one would transform in a different way. OK, from here itself, we can see clearly that the upper one and the lower one transform in a uh, completely different way because they have, have a different minus signs. Essentially, the quantity which we see is one is mi minus P dot sigma and another is P dot sigma. Under Lorentz transformations, OK, P dot sigma is not Lorentz invariant, whereas P dot sigma whole square is Lorentz invariant that we have seen, right? That P dot sigma square is nothing but P square times one. Okay. P dot sigma is not Lorentz invariant because it only contains a three component uh, thing. Okay. So the upper one has a different sign and the lower one has a different sign. So that is one of the things. The total one is not also not invariant so you can imagine that okay the p0 transforms and p dot sigma transforms but the p is multiplying a so the p a p0 is coming with p a whereas p dot sigma is coming with uh, with uh, the lower component and P0 minus M is coming with upper component. So similarly, P dot sigma is coming with the upper component and minus P dot M is coming with lower component. So the Lorentz transformations of the Dirac equation are slightly complicated actually. are complicated and uh, I think uh, it will be dealt in detail in QM3 course. I won't uh, uh, do that course, uh, meaning I won't go into the details of it, but I'll just 
use some results. We, what we will do is we will only do the results. OK, we will find, find, uh, finally see the results essentially. So it turns out what we need uh, uh, for the Lorentz covariance is a set of gamma matrices. We, what we had to show explicitly, we had to show that there is some, uh, say, suppose if there is an operator S, so psi of X is the Lorentz transformation, so goes to, say, psi prime. In fact, it's psi prime of X prime, is goes to some psi of X. If this is, it turns out that Typically, for proper Lorentz transformations and uh, space rotations, S is not unitary. That means <clears throat> is not equal to one. So if S dagger S is not equal to one, what will happen is if I take psi dagger psi is equal to say psi prime dot psi prime, okay, psi dagger the psi dagger, that means psi dagger s dagger s psi, that is not equivalent to psi dagger psi because s dagger s is not equal to 1. OK. So this S matrix, which is essentially a Lorentz transformation um, uh, uh, on the Dirac spinal, is not a unitary transformation. It's not a unitary transformation for proper Lorentz transformation. To be more technically correct, for space rotations and for proper Lorentz transformations, this is not a unitary matrix. Why is this happening? Because as I have been stressing, the space of spinors is different compared to the Lorentz space. So it is not ordinary Lorentz space where it is a four vector, OK, or whether it is a, a bit uh, winning. Uh, whether it is a four vector uh, uh, or uh, say, for example, it's not a Lorentz vector, uh, say, for example, it's not like, say, phi, the klein gordon field. or a mu or p mu four vectors under Lorentz transformations. Now, what is this S? OK, what is this S? S, technically, you can derive it, will be given in particular case exponential uh, so minus i by 4 sigma mu nu, theta mu nu, some parameters and sigma mu nu is i by 2 gamma mu um, the correct commutator of Lorentz these are the commutator uh, of gamma matrices OK, 
Okay, we don't need uh, the complete details of this uh, uh, matrix. What we need is a small for infinitesimal transformations and everything. So uh, this is the formal formal form of the S operator. This is the generator of small Lorentz transformations and actually uh, one of the main things which we learn in uh, relativistic quantum mechanics is how to write uh, meaning to prove that the Dirac equation is Lorentz covariant and for that we need to use all these operators and everything. But let's just uh, cut short everything and just write down a simple form for S. Okay, let me write down a simple form for S. So uh, this uh, this simple form is what we can use from, uh, say, for example, uh, Griffiths. So psi prime is equal to S. So C Griffiths. It's actually well done here. And that's more than enough for our discussion. So S is equal to a plus plus a minus. So I'll define what are this a plus and gamma zero, gamma one. So this gives me in the notation here, uh, meaning in the notation of the gamma matrices. A plus a minus sigma one, a minus sigma one. A plus. So there is a minus sign here. As in this, uh, sorry, this is a plus here. So this is equal to a four by four matrix because it works on a plus zero zero a plus zero a plus a minus zero zero a minus a plus zero a minus 0, 0, A minus. Now we can clearly see, so when this acts on the up one, two components, it acts with A plus and A plus A minus. Three, four components, it acts with A minus A plus and A minus A minus. So this is obvious, this is what I have been saying that the upper two components transform differently and the lower two components transform differently. This we are seeing it in several ways and this is what. And what is the definition of A plus? A plus is equal to plus square root of 1 by 2 gamma minus 1. This gamma is equal to 1 by square root of 1 minus beta square where beta is equal to V by C. OK, so this is actually the, the gamma of the, the Lorentz boost, essentially. The gamma of what we introduced in the special theory of relativity and the lecture two or three, essentially. So with this form, explicit form of for the S, we can check S dagger S is not equivalent to one. OK, so uh, it's very nicely written in terms of A plus and A minus. OK, so what it uh, so this S is for so small Lorentz transformations, you can really write it in this particular fashion. And this S shows you how the Lorentz, uh, the Dirac wave functions transform under uh, under Lorentz transformation. Psi goes to si the transformation of the Dirac spinor under
So now the question arises, how do we form Lorentz scalars four vectors and tensors with spinors now this is a very very important question because suppose if we don't have lorentz scalars okay that means we cannot really have uh, an invariant quantity you cannot really construct because we need so for example lagrangians dirac lagrangian should be a lorentz scalar so all the lagrangian should be a lorentz scalar now how do you, you cannot even construct lagrangians okay so if you cannot really uh, have what are this uh, uh, meaning how do, if you don't know how to construct this ones then we will not be having any possibilities of this one so luckily what it turns out is if even if s itself is uh, uh, not unitary you can have things like you can show that s inverse if you multiply with gamma zero then s inverse is equal to s dagger so you can construct s inverses so if you multiply with gamma zero you can construct unitary operators so this is an important thing okay so this implies that you can have invariant quantities from multiplying with gamma zero in another words what we can say is if you multiply with gamma zero you can have uh, uh, meaning say for example s dagger gamma zero s which is nothing but uh, gamma zero is equal to gamma zero this is the possibility okay one of the main things is if you because gamma zero is a four by four matrix, so you can always write s inverse gamma zero s inverse s is equal to gamma zero. So that means this is unitary s inverse. Okay, where I replaced. Uh, okay, no, sorry, sorry, sorry. This is. Uh, 4 by 4 matrix so you can write an operator in this fashion so then i can have gamma 0 uh, gamma 0 square is equal to 1 as you remember uh, so you can have uh, multiply both sides uh, wherever there is a dagger i can replace uh, with gamma zero on both sides so, so this will also imply okay that i can construct uh, operators with s inverse instead of uh, uh, gamma z uh, s daggers anyway so what it means that because it's a four by four matrix you need to apply lorentz transformation on both sides both uh, uh, on uh, left hand side and right hand side okay it's like an gamma zero is in like an operator so psi is also an operator but it's like a wave function so you can think in terms of wave function so uh, gamma zero will be lacking like an operator so the main point is that the gamma matrices themselves should be shown to be covariant they can themselves transform under lorentz transformations that's the reason why all this is happening so you, you need to it can be shown that the form of the ga gamma matrices will remain invariant uh, under uh, the Lorentz transformations. 
anyway that part we will so it later on uh, we will not show it but this can be studied in say for example in uh, various textbooks on quantum field theory like for example bjorken and rel relativistic quantum mechanics um or uh, some modern textbooks uh, or griner relativistic quantum mechanics and so on so ah uh, so now what we have seen is that if you multiply with gamma zero things will become uh, sort of sorted out meaning you can really so now let's look at the transformation what we had to look at so if we have instead of sandwiching uh, what we have is suppose if i define psi bar is equal to psi dagger gamma zero so i want to instead of taking the complex conjugate just as psi dagger but if i multiply with gamma zero if i sandwich a gamma zero then psi bar psi is equal to now let me put a bar as uh, transformation properties electric uh, of this would be okay let's first do that what is psi bar psi okay <clears throat> so putting a gamma zero would help that's a basic point that putting a gamma zero will help now let's me define a first a scalar quantity of this particular type so psi bar is equal to psi bar psi dagger gamma zero so psi bar psi would be psi 1 square plus psi 2 square minus psi 3 square minus psi 4 square why do you get the minus signs because gamma zero is 1 0 0 minus 1 remember the gamma zero okay the definition of the gamma zero is nothing but beta okay and gamma zero is one zero uh, zero minus one uh, it is uh, gamma zero is called one zero zero minus one i think it is there in the uh, several times in the previous lecture so if you multiply psi 1 psi 2 psi 3 psi 4 with this so the lower two components get a minus sign and you get this one now what we can show is that this thing psi bar psi is invariant under lorentz transformations So how do we show that? We can show that psi bar prime psi prime is equal to psi dagger gamma zero psi dagger gamma zero that is equal to psi dagger s dagger gamma zero s psi prime. No. Sorry, sorry. Here it should be s. Okay. So this, I said that psi dagger gamma zero psi is invariant to equivalent, or it's just equivalent to gamma zero. So I can substitute that. So I get psi dagger gamma zero psi, and that is equivalent to psi bar. So what we have is a Lorentz invariant quantity. It's a Lorentz invariant quantity, that means psi bar psi is a Lorentz invariant quantity. This is not covariant, this is invariant. So it's a Lorentz scalar.
Okay, just for a couple of minutes, I'll just uh, recap what we have done so far. Okay, uh, this is an important point because I or I want to stress this, uh, stress this a little bit more. Uh, uh, because I, I, we are not going into the complete derivation and you know the entire point, uh, meaning how to show this. Okay, the point is that the Dirac equation is not the Lorentz invariant quantity, and, and in fact, the Dirac uh, equation is something called. Uh, it's form invariant, but the form is the same in every Lorentz frame. The form of the Dirac equation is every uh, in the frame, but the wave function, the solutions of the Dirac equation are not the same, okay, in every frame. So if you want to connect, go from one frame to another, the solution would be a different solution. So it is not like Klein-Gordon equation where the solution is the same in every frame of reference. Okay, the form of the solution could be the same, but uh, it's a form invariant, but the solution itself is not invariant because uh, it depends upon, uh, it inherently has the information about the spin of the particle and the momentum comes in a linear fashion. It doesn't really come in terms of a, uh, in terms of uh, invariant quantities like p squares or m squares. Essentially. So the momentum comes in terms of sigma dot p, which cut, it automatically it's a projection of the spin on the momentum. So that's how it enters. The sigma dot p is the sigma is essentially the spin matrices, right? Remember the spin of the any uh, particle which we have seen is essentially given in terms of the spin matrices, uh, in terms of the uh, poly matrices. So for that reason, the Dirac equation, the solution to the Dirac equation are not invariant like a klein gordon equation or so on. So. so the solutions are sort of different. They get modified as you transform the velocities essentially. So if you go from a high velocity frame to a lower velocity frame, the projection of the spin on the direction of the momentum would be different. That is one complication. The other complication is the upper two components, okay, transform in a different way compared to the lower two components because one transforms as sigma dot p, other transforms as minus sigma dot p, okay. So one transforms with a positive, okay. I'll define what the sigma dot p is. It has a definite name actually. We will see in. Uh, in the coming days, essentially, uh, we'll have to define the, the, this projection. Okay, let me define it right away. This uh, sigma dot p is something called the helicity of the particle. Okay, for a massless particle, it is uh, for a massless particle, it's something called the helicity. Okay, for a massive particle, it gets related to something called the chirality, but uh, we'll come to it a bit later, essentially. Okay. So the sigma dot p is the projection of the spin in the direction of the momentum, okay? And so for the upper type particles, it transforms in a different, upper two components transform in a different way, the lower two components transform in a different way. So with that, we not, the, okay, we want to see uh, how the Lorentz transformations are transforming and we want to construct Lorentz invariant as well as covariant quantities. The first thing we want is how to construct a Lorentz scalar, meaning something which is invariant under all, because the Lagrangian should be always a Lorentz scalar. It should be real, it should be a Lorentz scalar, because a Lagrangian should be equivalent to, it's nothing but the uh, energy relations, no? uh, 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 kinetic energy minus the <coughs> potential energy. So for that, it looks like if we just directly take the transformation, the Lorentz transformation, the S, which is the Lorentz transformation, this S is itself is not a unitary matrix. Because it's not a unitary matrix, if you look at the length of the norm of the, okay, the norm of the Dirac spinor, norm of the Dirac spinor is not invariant under Lorentz transformations. 
so the norm so it's not like lorenz uh, meaning un- under like ordinary uh, okay uh, if you just take the ordinary norm that means psi dagger psi it is not invariant under lorenz transformations norm is nothing but the length of a vector say for example if you have any vector under rotations it's always invariant so under rotations it's only but lorenz transformations are rotations plus boosts also okay and also the di- spinorial space is completely different compared to the ordinary vectorial spaces okay the spinorial space is different because it can it comes as representations of the gamma matrices okay or sort of uh, they uh, not uh, sorry it comes uh, okay uh, it comes out as representations uh, yeah uh, because the lorentz transformations come out as representations of the gamma matrices because it okay given in terms of the gamma matrices <laughs> and so this s dagger is not a unitary matrix so what happens is uh, the uh, you can show that if we write for small lorentz transformations given by this particular form form okay of the s matrix s is nothing but uh, lorentz transformation matrix it can be shown that s dagger s is not equal to 1 now the question is how can we construct lorentz invariant uh, lorentz scalars So for that we use a trick that we notice that s dagger gamma zero s is equal to gamma zero. Okay, s dagger gamma zero s is nothing but gamma zero. So gamma zero is invariant under uh, this Lorentz transformations. So using that, okay. so the point is gamma zero is always a hermitian matrix if you remember correctly it's always a hermitian matrix gamma da, uh, gamma i here anti hermitian matrices so that's the reason why there is a difference so using that you can define a quantity psi bar gamma uh, psi dagger gamma zero which has positive signs for uh, it adds up psi 1 and psi 2 and minus signs for the other two components so this quantity psi bar psi is a lorentz invariant quantity it's a lorentz scalar and this we can prove it easily okay just by assuming that relation so that's the reason why we can construct uh, lorentz scalars okay using bars rather than uh, daggers okay ba daggers are not lorentz invariant daggers are not lorentz invariant but bars are so from this we can start constructing more and more lorentz uh, invariant quantities pauli has classified all the possible lorentz covariance one can construct from two dirac spinors these are called bilinear covariance so these are what what we want actually this is what what we want so let's uh, list this bilinear covariance the first one of this bilinear covariance is the lorentz scalar this is nothing but psi bar psi this is nothing but s okay scalar okay the next one is called a vector okay 
this transforms exactly like a mu p mu exactly under lorentz transformations psi bar gamma mu psi transforms like a lorentz vector then of course we had to ask what happens to tensors yes there is a quantity psi bar sigma mu psi where sigma mu is the commutator not the anti commutator of the gamma matrices okay this transforms as lorentz tensor there are other bilinear covariants depending upon some other quantity called gamma phi but i'll come to uh, that in a bit later actually okay so this is how one constructs uh, 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 what are called these quantities which are called uh, uh, now if you know how this these are also called lorentz uh, meaning uh, current actually we will we'll come to it okay so this is called uh, okay now knowing this okay knowing this now we can ask the similar questions about how do you write down the probability current and density for dirac spinors so the probability current for the dirac spinors rho is equal to psi bar gamma bar psi and current j bar is equal to psi bar gamma i psi so the total current rho j bar is equal to j mu okay j mu the probability current is given by psi bar gamma and the continuity equation tells you that so this is the definition of the probability current so the rho is psi bar gamma zero psi and j bar is gamma zero now notice that there is a bar here okay so this current has a bar so if you expand rho but this is not a lorentz invariant quantity the rho is not a lorentz but it's a so the current j mu psi bar gamma mu j also transforms as a lorentz uh, under lorentz transformations so it is not a lorentz invariant quantity unlike uh, say for example even that's true even also in for the case of um, which is true even in the case of the klein gordon equation so the currents don't transforms in the same I mean, they are not invariant quantity they are not uh, they are covariant quantities they are not invariant quantities essentially okay
OK. Now, now that we have defined uh, this, uh, OK? So now, what about the other solutions? What is the other thing we need? We need, the, the, we started with the two solutions we wanted, right, essentially. We need orthonormal relations and completeness relations. So now we can define them because we had defined uh, uh, um, bar. So what are these uh, orthonormal relations and uh, completeness relations? So if we have these functions, uh, the, uh, the mu and, uh, okay. So for that, let's just go further. These momentum space relations, solutions. So the momentum space solutions, uh, which I have written here in the previous case, four canonical equations. solutions so we will write them the positive energy solutions so psi solutions and V to be negative energy solutions. Okay, so this four positive and negative energy solutions are given by U of one, or uh, the first one is N. We'll define what is N is uh, okay. One, I showed you in the previous class how to derive them. So PZ by E plus M, then PX plus IPY by E plus M, N is equal to square root of E plus M. So uh, if you uh, remember that we had uh, e plus m, e plus m, there will be, a, uh, in the denominator, there was an e plus m, right? Essentially, there, uh, let me 